elegates us. We have mad ideas, we have a whole team of engineers who will build an idea, build this, this incredible product, mm -hmm. and then Ella is the one who will go to the users and organize the system to test and find out how good that product is. She finds us the metrics to know, are we doing okay? And uh, yeah, we'd have been in a lot of trouble without her. <laughs> Welcome back everybody, Bruce Bigger, Shanghai-based social entrepreneur. I'm in Ho Chi Minh City this week and I have just had one of the most amazing conversations. For all the things that we've been talking about on this channel, about co-founding teams, about the need to have a good number two, about the mission being super clear with a product that is aligned to that, this is the video to watch, bar none. Introduce yourself to the community, maybe individually, and then what you're doing here at Vulcan. My name is Rafael Masters. I'm the CEO of Vulcan Augmetics. We make uh, affordable, customizable, upgradable robotic arms for amputees in developing countries. We also design them to have special attachments to help people get back into the workplace. My name is Al Lachin. Uh, I'm general manager of Vulcan Augmetics and together with um, Rafael, we are running a startup to put uh, 38 million amputees in developing country back into the workforce. How did you get started? Like, what was, this, what was the founding story for this organization? I grew up next to the biggest disabled college in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, most of my friends when I was a teenager were in wheelchairs and they lived really full active lives. And we were always very much aware that that was thanks to the the community around them and the technology that they were able to access. And so we started out designing these uh, special prosthetics that we basically followed a different design philosophy to let people do more things. So we asked our, we recruited our UX guy, Dirk, um, he's a, a blow elbow amputee, mm -hmm. and we asked him, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, so I want to uh, use a computer and I want to play pool or billiards mm -hmm. and I want to play guitar. So the first prototype we did, very, very basic, was we put the guitar plectrum into the thumb mm. so that he could just r switch it around and just move the hand up and down to play. We put a little stand on top of the, on top of the palm so that he could use that as a rest for playing billiards. Mm. And we built a mouse mm. into one of the hands so that he could actually have one hand to type and one hand to use the mouse. Can you just like, show me a couple of the, the, what we're looking at here, what's in front of us? And how you approach you know, creating something that is accessible, affordable. What are we looking at? What is your innovation process? And how, do you, how much do these cost to the, to the market that you're working with them? This is one of our older models, um, but it follows the basic uh, principles that we've established, which is one, making it modular. So this socket is the only part that needs to be manufactured by a normal clinic. Um, later on, we'll make our own that can just be shipped out to the user direct. Mm. So the clinic makes this. The arm is, again, currently 3D printed, eventually uh, injection molded. It's, mm -hmm. So it's 3D printed TPU, which is very flexible and means that it can fit almost any socket. This arm uh, was actually originally designed for a different socket, but we've put this one on as a demonstration. Um, the connection to the hand, as mentioned, modular, so it just can click out like this. Mm. And what makes, what makes that significant is that with a normal prosthetic, if, say, the prosthetic hand has a problem, if it was someone in Vietnam and they were in the countryside, so your hand has a problem, you have to call your clinic, you have to make an appointment, you have to take the time off work, you have to travel into the city, you have to book the hotel, give the clinic your hand, wait a few days, maybe up to a week. If it's a really big problem, they might send it back to Germany, which is like another mm. three weeks. Whereas with our version, if your hand has a problem and it's something that can't be fixed remotely, which mm. we're also working on, then you just tell us, take it off, we'll send you a new one in a box, it gets to your door, click it on, mm -hmm. off you go. Uh, in terms of functionality, so the at the moment, the nearest thing to what we do in terms of uh, price or robotic hands, mm. it basically offers this grip only. And um, you can see that with our hand here, we have that very basic bottle grip, it's yeah. called. Uh, but we felt that that wasn't enough. Um, so we've also created our own device here with the thumb that allows you to use one motor to have several different grips. So you've got move it up and you've got the pinch grip for uh, pens, chopsticks or whatever and up one more and you have a uh, key grip so okay. it's rotation. 
Um, so that way we've managed to cut down costs hugely and with very clever mechanical engineering we've created a product that is yeah, it's more cost effective and more functional than our nearest competitor. Um, we've also very specifically gone for this kind of robotic, <laughs> high-tech <laughs> look. Uh, because our philosophy is that this is a phenomenal bit of technology. It is something that people should be proud to have, proud to wear. People should not be shy or embarrassed about having this awesome bit of gear on them. You gave us the example of your, your son like Star Wars, right? Yeah. Well, another good example of that would be Winter Soldier. Mm. So in the Marvel series, you've got Winter Soldier, who is in fact an amputee. Mm. He's missing an entire arm from the shoulder joint. But when people see him, they don't think, oh, he's disabled. Mm. Their first thought is, wow, he looks tough and super strong. Mm. Yeah. And that's kind of why we've gone with this image. They should feel like they are high tech. It mm. should not feel like they're broken or being patched up. They right, should right. feel like they are pioneers because mm -hmm. they are you, so you're in prototype mode mm -hmm. you've been at this for three years two two I'm at least two okay you have 11 engineers you have a oh, yeah. you have eight engineers eight engineers 11 staff you have a lot of equipment cost some capital where did you get your money um, how did you build a runway and what do you see going forward for the next couple of years when it comes to mm. your business model Okay, so we, we are super lean. We've bootstrapped everything. Um, the total funding that we have had to date is about $80,000. The, wow. the total that we have spent is about fifty. For two years. For two years. So the first set of investment was uh, myself and the venture builder. We both put in uh, about 30000 between us. Okay. And then we got um, some seed investment from VSV, Vietnam Silicon Valley. Uh, okay. They are a local, like a combination of a venture capitalist group, but also um, they're connected with the government speed up program. So they, they also sort of are part of that ecosystem trying to encourage Vietnam as a tech capital. Mm -hmm. So uh, they agreed to put in $50,000 okay. um, at, yeah, at a 1 million valuation, so 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's where we are now. We've had about two years of development for 50,000. We've yep. got nine prototypes. We've fitted four people. We've taken in about $25,000 worth of pre-orders. Um, and we're currently in the next round of uh, funding where we're hunting around for the next round so that we can um, basically get the medical license and move to full-scale production and start doing proper sales. So then What's the funding you guys think you need for, say, the next 18 months, three years? And what are the sources of funding that you are looking at? So for about 12 months roadmap, um, that would, we'd ask for about $250,000. Mm -hmm. That will get us through the next 12 months organic growth and into the next country. Mm -hmm. If we were looking at 18 months and more accelerated growth, we'd be talking about $450,000, which is, again, we've also fully costed and budgeted that out. For sources, we're, we're open to almost anything, uh, provided that it doesn't come with too great a loss of control. Um, mm. So we're, we're quite keen to look at grants. Uh, we're quite keen to look at angels and impact investors because they're people who can share a vision. Mm -hmm. um, we are also perfectly happy to work with the more conventional VCs but it's, it's something where we, we have a very clear idea of where we're going and the impact that we want to have. And so we'd have to find a, a VC that could understand and be fully supportive of that plan and that would be, and that's willing to accept that we are unconventional. So what is the impact you want to have? Do you want to talk about impact metrics or crazy visions? No, like crazy vision. What, what, do you, what do you think that this will lead to? Um, it, <laughs> okay, this is the fun one. Is, it, right. to, is it to solve the, the problem of developing nations and, and basically the, the cost of affordability, or is it you want to sell this into a large multinational medical equipment company as an IT platform and exit that way? So the long-term vision, there are, there are at least five. Um, so the first one is at the moment when you, if you have an accident and you wake up in the hospital and you see your arm is gone, mm. that's a horrifying moment mm. and you, you can feel your life crashing down around you. Uh, just the shock and awe, it's phenomenal. Like, it's just 
crushing. Yeah. And it's like a two-year recovery process. Most of these people will go and spend two years sitting alone in their room until they sort of get through the grieving process and, and develop that confidence. Mm. What I want is for you to wake up in that hospital, look down at that missing arm and think, bollocks, I'm going to be out of work for like a week. Mm. It's going to take me days to get this sorted out. We should have like that absolute level mm. of confidence where we know that our body can be taken care of. We know that replacements are available. The other vision is that, again, in 30 years or so, people are going to be hitting 90 and the doc's going to say, look, you've got really bad rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. You're, you've got really bad nerve damage, like, your, mind, your brain's fine, but like, your body's screwed. So I'll tell yeah. you what, it's time to take that off and start upgrading. Mm. And that's the other part. This is going to be something that people choose to do. People are doing it already with their chips. People are doing it already with implants, pacemakers. We're 3D printing kidneys, for God's sake. So this is not technology that's Never that far. Yeah, this is technology that's not that far out there. You know, it's yeah. and you can you can try and develop this by you know throwing millions and millions and millions of dollars at high end R and D. Or you can do what we do, which is get the product on people, find out what their needs are, mm. design the most efficient, effective use of technology to yeah. reach them. So that's, that's where it's going to be in, in 20 or 30 years. We're starting with developing nations because one, the people need us there. Yeah. Two, it's a it's blue ocean market to enter. Yeah. Mm. And three, this is a slightly cynical one, but you've got, those aren't 38 million broken people. Those are 38 million potential walking, talking test beds and pioneers for future technology. Mm. These are people who should be, you know, leading the way instead of being left behind. So that's, that's the impact, that's the metric. We're going to change how the world sees amputees, change how they see themselves, and long term, basically own the human body, give people that level of confidence. Because mm. it should be. It's mm. the, what's valuable and important in humans is, is all in here. Yeah. This is just an organic machine to get it around. Mm. So why should we not take that approach one step further and give people that level of, of confidence? That's awesome. And now, if you look at the products you're developing, what are some things that you think Vietnam needs that's a little bit different from what you're developing now? Like you wish you could offer in, you, if you had some design input, what's the next attachment that you think would really work here right now? For the next step, we just more focusing on women. Mm. Like what we see, uh, what you see right here is very robotic, um, very cool tech, and winter soldier, Iron Man kind of uh, direction. But yeah. what I want is we focus more on female, mm. make the product cool tech, but at the same time more elegant. Mm. You know, like Vietnamese Vietnamese lady are kind of, you know, we we small and cute. Um, and to go with tech, you, you gotta make the, the balance. Right. So actually right, right now we're pushing the design team to have more um, aesthetic mm -hmm. options for the female amputees. And that's what we are focusing right now and in the next um, few months, mm -hmm. you're gonna see not only, you know, cool uh, winter soldier amputees, but also kind of a little look uh, yeah. for the, the user. Now, if you weren't here, would they be focusing on that as a market, as an opportunity? Oh, I, yeah. don't, I don't think we would, <laughs> nowhere near as strongly. Um, like is it the woman's touch that's bringing that to you? No, I don't, I don't think it's very specifically the woman's touch. Mm. It's just that... Um, I think it's more like Ella sees, uh, Ella sees things slightly differently. I would have just focused on, right, we've got this thing and it looks good. Let's keep making this thing better. And uh, yeah. I think it just wouldn't have occurred to me to spend that much time this early on, on mm. something that was just for women. But Ella's uh, experience, not, not because she is female, but because she's been the one doing a lot of the focus groups, a lot of the user interactions. Mm. So it's something that from her very much uh, comes from thinking this through and, and her experience dealing with our actual users. Mm. And again, that's something that I'm not quite... Uh, well, 
I don't speak enough Vietnamese to conduct interviews in that kind of depth. So okay. Okay. it's absolutely something they'll. So I'm I'm not bad at having mad ideas and, and mm. crazy visions and <laughs> mechanical sort of devices. <laughs> but we need someone who can say, okay, so to do your mad thing, we need to do A, B, C, and D, and we need people to do that, and we need. And this is interesting because I talk a lot about co-founding teams, mm. the role of a great number two who can just work with the entrepreneur, the, the visionary, and just make sure that when they throw spaghetti at the wall, that someone there is to make sure, like, catalog mm. it, and make it and make it happen. So, mm. are you a co-founder? Are you a number two? And how is it that you help this guy? So um, I uh, came into Vulcan when it was still a project called Iron Man, mm. and the, the the project name like just caught my attention. Really, I think it's that's the coolest thing that I've, I've ever heard in my startup life. And when I met um, Rafael and also Akshay, I saw really good um, chemistry. Yeah. Like I really love um, their vision, mission, and um, just. It's just very connected with my own personal value, you know, to support the, the, the community. First, I was a bit reluctant because it's so techy. I, I don't have like great interest in tech uh, at that point. I was like, I, I'm more interested in supporting the community, not the, the tech side. Back then, um, he showed me a video of uh, an amputee who was uh, riding on a motorbike built by himself. Like an amputee, a double amputee built a, a, a motorbike for himself to ride by his legs and it was really amazing and actually is that um, so Ella this is the the people the community mm -hmm. that we at uh, Vulcan um, want to build up they have great potential yeah. and with technology with vision and with you as uh, you know someone who understand the local and someone who got really good connection with the community mm -hmm. we can make this happen Ella grades us <coughs> mm. so we have mad ideas, we have a whole team of engineers who will build an idea, build this, this incredible product. Mm. And then Ella is the one who will go to the users and organize the system to test and find out how good that product is. And she will basically, she finds us the metrics to know, are we doing okay? Mm. And uh, yeah, we've been in a lot of trouble without her. <laughs> <laughs> and so how difficult is that? Raphael is rather a very um, ambitious, uh, very creative uh, guy like when you give him a, a problem he will just instantly jump into solutions he had so many ideas and solutions which is great but you know like at the end of the day we need to get back into the the root of the problem that we are making it for the user and we need to understand what the amputees here in Vietnam actually need um, so I think uh, I play a fairly well uh, good role at you know like um, understanding the user here yeah. and put the tech innovation back into the practicality of it. That interplay is something that I have not seen in a very long time of interviewing <laughs> people. So really congratulations on that. Um, I, I know how lucky I am. <laughs>